okay, let's suppose Nancy has three has classes three days a week. She attends classes three days a week, 80% of the time, two days, 15% of the time, and one day, 4% of the time. Suppose one week is randomly selected. So before I even start to read part A, let's think about like, what on earth is varying here? What are we keeping track of? And in part A, I, I set you up, right? I say X is the number of, and I give you a little bit more of a hint, number of days, Nancy. All right, and what we're thinking about with Nancy or what we're keeping track of with Nancy is how many days a week she t attends class, right? We got info on three, two, and one. So this is the number of days Nancy attends class in one week. All right, is X discrete or continuous? Well, I'm not gonna measure the number of days that Nancy attends class. I'm definitely gonna count it so it's discrete. And, and I said there's, there's a quick little thing for chapter four. You always know it's discrete in chapter four. But once we get moving on past chapters five and six, it's good to be able to identify is it discrete or continuous because you'll have to decide at that point. But for right now in chapter four, it's always discrete. X takes on what's, what values? What's the sample space? Well, imagine you had class three days a week. Let's say you had a Monday, Wednesday, Friday class. You could show up all three days. You could show up two out of those three days. You could show up one out of those three days. Or you actually could show up no, none. I don't know how to say that, I do. You could show up none of those three days. So we have four values here. Zero, one, two, th or three. So we can show up zero, one, two, or three days out of this three day a week class. So let's look at part D. It says suppose one week is randomly chosen. Construct a probability distribution table, or we could call it a PDF table. Like the one in the previous example, the table should have two rows and we're gonna label them X and P of X. So I'm gonna make this table in a moment and just kind of piggybacking off of the last example, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make five columns because I have four values in my variable, so I'll need one column for each of those values, but I also want a column just to label things, all right? because I should have a, a label of x and p of x. So I'm going to move this up so we have room to see everything, and then I'm just going gonna, um, gonna to lay out my table. All right, so I'm starting to make my table. I got X on the top row, P of X on the bottom row, and the sample space always goes on the top row. So we'll go zero, one, two, and three, always. Now this is one of those versions of the problem where I had to create the table. It wasn't given to me, but we have enough information to do it. So let's go back to the original problem, right? It says she attends classes three days a week, 80% of the time. So I'm gonna put 80% under here. And you can see she attends class two days a week, 15% of the time, one day a week, 4% of the time. And then we get to this part where, you know, folks will say, well, they didn't give me any, any information about zero. They kind of did. It's implied. All right, it's not explicit, but it is implied what this number is. 
So the number here, we can find it because there's a big property about PDFs where, yes, these numbers need to be between zero and one, each of them individually, but collectively, they have to add up to one. So if these four numbers have to add up to one, and I know three of them, and I, I just don't know that missing one, I can find it. So let's see how much probability we have already. So if I look at this, I've got 0.04 plus 0.15 plus 0.8. It looks like I have 99% already. And if we remember the complement rule from chapter three, it said that if you wanted to find these numbers, right, these numbers collectively have to add up to one. So I use one minus what I already have, the complement rule, and I get that 0.01. So I know 1% needs to be here. So the complement rule helps us figure out what's missing. So if these add up to 99%, and collectively they have to add up to one, I can use one minus 0.99 and find that missing 1%. All right, so let's just take a note right here, right? These sum to one. And that's what part E is asking us also. It's, it's just straight up asking, hey, what did these values sum to? They should sum to one, okay? Now, before we leave this problem behind, I just wanna show you what the PDF histogram would look like. I know we've been doing the table here and that's great because we're going to make a table most of the time, but I do want you to see what the PDF table, excuse me, the PDF histogram would look like. So let me go back into my lists and clear out what I have and put in, like always, the values of our variable into L1 and I'm going to put in those probabilities or those relative frequencies into L2. All right, I'm going to start with zoom 9 and I have a feeling I'm gonna to have to alter it, but let's see what zoom nine gives us. So there's zoom nine, two gigantic rectangles. And that's not what we want. Right, you can see I actually would like four rectangles because I have four values of my variable. So I need to go to window and check this out. The main problem is that X scale. So let me take this down to one. I, I think I'm still gonna alter some stuff, but let me see how we're doing so far. So that's a little better. I can see I have a lot of space on the right side. So let me clear this out. I don't need to all, go all the way to six. I think I'll just go up to four. That'll still give me a little bit of room. All right, and there is my PDF, or my PDF histogram specifically. If I hit trace, we can see 1%, 4%, 15%, and 80%. Right, this is severely skewed left. Yeah, so while the median might be here, the mean's been dragged down a little bit. And if I'm feeling this out, I feel like the mean and median are somewhere in this, this range, right? Somewhere between two and three, but maybe a little bit closer to three. I can feel the weight pushed over here, right? This is where more of the, the values are clumping because look at there's 95% of your observations are in the two and three, um, the, this two column and this three column. So I can really feel that weight over there. And again, you're seeing that played out on the histogram because it's skewed left. All right, so with that, let's try a multiple choice question. So for example four, all right, I, I like this problem already on site better because I can just see that they gave me all of my PDFs. I don't have to calculate anything. They're all here. And it's just asking me, hey, which of the following is a legit, a valid, discrete PDF? And if we remember back to the previous page, there were two rules that a legitimate PDF needed to have. So every value had to be between zero and one on that bottom row. And then that bottom row had to add to one. So that's how you get a valid PDF. So let's go find the answer for example four. All right, so as we're starting to look at the example four a little bit more closely, let's go with this, this first one. All right, so I see a lot of point ones on the denominator, not the denominator, on the bottom row. All right, point one, point one, point one, point one, point one, point one, point, all of that. But these numbers are collectively between zero and one, so that passes the first round. So this is still a candidate, all right? I'll put so far, it's okay. When I look at these numbers, right, 0 0.2, 0 0.6, 0 0.2, 0 0.1, all of these probabilities are numbers between 0 and 1. So, so far, this one's okay, right? It's passing our first property 
of being a legit PDF. Same thing here. All of these numbers are between 0 and 1. We're okay. But if you look down at D, something changed. You see the negative 0.3? and the negative 0.2. That is not allowed, so D can get ruled out. D does not meet the first property of being a legitimate PDF. Okay, So we've ruled out D, so that gets it down to A, B, and C, and the second property of being a legit PDF is that these numbers on the bottom here have to total out to 1. So I'm going to start with part C, so I'm working my way back up now. All right, let's see what we got. 0.3 plus 0.2 plus 0.1 is 0.6. That is not 1. All right, so this is going to fail that second property, right? Probabilities do not sum to 1. So C gets ruled out. All right, working my way back up. Let's Let's see how this, this PDF is doing. So we've got 0.2 plus 0.6 plus 0.2 plus 0.1. That's too much. All right, it's not 1. All right, so this one fails on the second property, right? Probabilities do not sum to 1. So let's try this next one. I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So when we do 10 times 0.1, or you could add 0.1 10 times if you want, all right, we got 1. That is legit. All right, so this one meets them on all fronts. And sometimes it can be a little confusing because you see these numbers up top and you're, you're saying, well, how can variables be negative? I thought they couldn't be negative. It's entirely possible to have negative values for your variable, but it's not possible to have negative values for your probability. And I can give you just a like cheesy example. Maybe x in this case is the number of friends I made this year. All right, it's very possible for me to lose one friend, lose two friends, right? And that's just me being silly. It also could be like how much money you won gambling. Maybe you lost a dollar, lost two dollars, that kind of thing. So it's very possible for your variables to be negative, but the probabilities definitely have to be between 0 and 1. Alright, so I'll catch you on the next page. We're going to keep on going with discrete random variables.